Welcome to a totally normal and standard PC build guide here on Linus Tech Tips, sponsored by Intel and featuring the Core i7-9700K. Today, we're gonna get started by, wait, 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 what are you doing right now? Oh, my head. Oh. Wait, what? Did my camera operator and I merge? I guess that's okay. People enjoy watching all kinds of content on the internet from a POV perspective. Oh, all right, well, let's get started then. As always, when building a PC, we need a safe, clutter-free, anti-static workstation with all the tools that we're gonna need. So we've got a magnetic parts tray, a knife, a pair of side cutters, needle nose pliers, thermal compound, cable ties, and of course, as always, a standard multi-bit screwdriver. First thing we're gonna do is get ourselves static safe. So we're gonna open up our power supply here. Then we're gonna flip the switch to the off position and plug it in. That way the chassis is grounded. So whenever we move our feet, we're gonna go ahead and touch that in order to dissipate any static that's built up on our bodies. For extra points, use an anti-static strap like this one from iFixit. Just put the alligator clamp on a metal part of your plugged in power supply and the other end either on your wrist or as I prefer to do it, on your ankle. This way is great because then this strap isn't getting in your way while you're trying to build. The next thing we're gonna need is the motherboard. So we'll start by clearing some space on our ESD safe work mat. We've gone with the ASUS Prime Z390P because our goal is to build a high performance gaming system, but without wasting any money on unnecessary gimmicks. So we're gonna need our IO shield for later. We're going to need the motherboard itself, but not this baggie, so we can go ahead and leave that behind. We're going to need these little screws for installing our SSD. And finally, we're going to need a SATA cable, which would be in the box if it was new, but we've used this motherboard before. I always like using the motherboard box as an additional test bench because it keeps it up off any debris that might be on my work surface. And if you don't have an anti-static work surface, well, it acts as one of those. For our CPU, as I've mentioned before, we've gone with the Core i7-9700K. Unlike the 9900K, it doesn't have hyper-threading, but for gaming, given that it already has eight cores, we're not really gonna need this. It boosts up to 4.9 gigahertz, and because it's a K-series chip, it's unlocked, so we can do a little bit of overclocking should we see fit. Let's go ahead and install it. Step one is to push down the lever, pull it out, and then, boop, the retention plate should move out of your way. Then, we're gonna see this little golden triangle here. We're gonna line that up with the dot at the corner of the socket. On some motherboard manufacturers, that'll actually also be a triangle. When we're putting it in, it's really important to apply no force at all. You're just kind of dropping it in in exactly the right spot. I recommend giving it a little wiggle to make sure that it's firmly in place. Next, we're gonna drop this plate down, making sure that it stays clear of this little screw right here. Then we go ahead and lower the arm, pull it out, and put it under the retention mechanism. This plate should pop off on its own. We're gonna hold on to that, putting it inside the box for our motherboard, because in the event that we need to return our motherboard to the manufacturer later, we will need to send it with this installed. For our memory, we've gone with a nice low latency DDR4-3200 kit from G-Skill. We went with 16 gigs of RAM in an eight gig by two configuration. This gives us dual channel operation for better performance and gives us plenty of expansion for the future. So we could go up to 32 gigs with no problems. When you're lining up the memory, make sure you carefully check the position of the notch. So you can see here that I need to flip this around in order for it to fit in the slot correctly. Pull back the tabs. Remember this side probably won't pull back on modern motherboards. Line it up and then push firmly from both sides until you hear a click on each end. Now it's time to install our M.2 SSD. We're using a 512 gig 760p series from Intel, but the instructions would be the same regardless. First, you're gonna wanna find the M.2 slot on your motherboard. We've actually got two here, one right here, one right here. Oh, okay, strictly speaking, there is a third one, but you can see this one is quite short and it's actually marked right there. It's intended for a Wi-Fi card. Next, we're just gonna hold our SSD up to it and see that, yep, okay, this is an 80 millimeter model, so that's where we're gonna wanna install our mounting post. Remember that bag I showed you guys before? This has two pieces in it. One of them is a male and female threaded mounting post. There we go, let's have a look at that. 
So you can see it screws into the motherboard there and then has a screw into the top of it there. And the other is a little tiny screw for securing the drive. You're unlikely to end up using a lot of force when you install your SSD, so just hand tight on this is fine. As for the drive itself, it installs just like laptop memory. So you go up at an angle, push it into the slot, and then just hold it down in place while you're screwing it in. Something to watch out for here, guys, is that while most computer screws are size two Phillips, these are usually size one, so you're probably gonna need to change your bit before you finish installing. So that's done, but I do have a couple more notes about M.2 installation. On our board, both of the slots were easily accessible, but that's not always the case. Some motherboards will have M.2 slots actually on the back of them. This is a space saving feature. And in some cases, even if they are on the front, they're gonna be covered by a heat spreader or a shroud. So you may actually need to remove screws in order to find them. Those heat spreaders are actually optional. They don't tend to help the drive dissipate a ton more heat than if they're just exposed and maybe have some incidental airflow from the case. But what they do do is they'll act as an absorber of heat, like a heat buffer, if your drive only sees intensive use from time to time. Now let's turn our attention to cooling. We've gone with the Noctua NHU-12S for its great balance of reliability, performance, cost, and of course, silence. But if you're not planning on doing any overclocking, you can of course save a buck by going with something a little bit less expensive. Actually, if you wanna save a buck and still get the same performance, you could just get the non-black one, but this is the LTT edition, so there was no way that we weren't gonna go with that. Every cooler's installation is going to vary slightly in the details, but with this video, and of course the included documentation, you shouldn't have any trouble with it. First up, we're going to need our back plate. The orientation of this is pretty easy to figure out once you know the guiding principles. Just check for where the centered hole is and align it like so. I'll flip this back around. Whenever you handle your motherboard, be careful to handle it by the edges or metal components or plastic connectors. That way you're never actually touching the PCB and putting your greasy skin oils on it. Next, because every CPU socket has a slightly different profile, we're gonna need these four spacers. This ensures that we don't have either too much or too little mounting pressure once our cooler is installed. The orientation we use to install our mounting bars is gonna determine which way our cooler ends up facing. So we can either install it with the fan blowing upward, making use of the exhaust at the top of our case, or we can install it with the fan blowing towards the back of our system where the IO is and make use of the pre-installed fan at the rear of our case. We're going for a front to back airflow configuration, so I'm gonna prefer to put it this way. That means our mounting bars are gonna go like this. Please note, the curved side goes out. Regardless of which spacers or backplates you're using, these four thumb nuts are gonna hold the mounting bars in place. We won't need most of the rest of these accessories, but there are a couple of things in the common parts bag that might come in handy. These little wire clips allow you to install a second fan on your cooler if you'd like. The low noise adapter caps the maximum RPM of the included fan if you want an extremely quiet experience, case batch. And of course, the thing we were actually after, thermal compound. It's actually harder than you'd think to apply too much thermal compound, at least from a performance perspective. You can definitely make a mess. So on a mainstream CPU like this one that has a relatively small integrated heat spreader, I'd recommend about yay much. And remember, if you're not sure, you can always install your cooler, give it a little smooshy smooshy, and then take it off. That way you'll know if you have the right amount. As you can see, we pretty much nailed that. The entire IHS is covered, and there's no gooped out part along the edge of the CPU. I guess we got ahead of ourselves a little bit there though. So to install the cooler, you're gonna need to take the fan off because otherwise there's no way to screw this in here. So you just go ahead and pull these clips back. Ugh. And the fan should come off a little something like that. I recommend lining up one of the screws in exactly the right spot. Maybe give it like a half turn, three quarter turn so that it's locked in place. And then go ahead and line the other one up on the post. There you go. Once they're both caught, 
Don't crank one all the way down and then start on the other one. I usually like to go until I feel kind of eh, a bit of resistance. Then go kind of past that point on the other side. Then a little more over here. That's topped. And all the way down over here. There we go. Once they both hit their stoppers, you're gonna know that the mounting pressure is correct. Nice little smooshy smooshy. Then we can go ahead and install our fan. So when you're putting on the fan, watch where the cable for the fan is coming off because you're gonna want it to be somewhat close to wherever the CPU fan connector is on your motherboard. In our case, it's this one right here, and this one's for an AIO pump. So we're gonna go ahead and install it right a little something like that. We're gonna try and install it evenly. There you go. Lining up the fan with the top of the heatsink there. And we just pull these back onto the retention sort of notches on the cooler, just like that. Yep, that looks even. Now we take our fan, we can tie it in a little knot so that it'll take up any extra slack that we have. We'll run that under there and see if we can, see if we can hit that. Yep, there it is. Okay. Now we'll just tuck that away so we don't have to look at it. Get in there. Get in there, yeah. Dirty thing. There. Ooh. That is nice and clean. Looking good. Now you might not have noticed, but as we've been going, I've been putting away all the extra accessories and packaging for the parts that we finished up with. That's for a very good reason. A, it means that you don't have to clean up all that stuff at the end. And B, it keeps our workspace nice and tidy. So we're less likely to knock something onto the floor and lose it or make a mistake. We chose Corsair's 460X RGB because A, it looks kind of nice, which is always great when you're making a video about something. And B, it's got a pretty standard layout compared to most modern cases. Side panels, regardless of whether they're tempered glass, always go back in the box until we're ready for them later. That way you can avoid scratching them. So if we look in here, we've got a bottom mounted power supply, in this case with a shroud, standard ATX layout, front intake here with filter, and then we're exhausting out the top or the back. I think this case has been used before. I'm not sure if these fans are normally pre-installed up there, but don't worry about it. Minor details. We'll get it all sorted out. As I'm removing pre-installed screws, hold on, I'm just gonna throw this back in here. I always like to use the case foam in between the case panels so they don't rub up against each other. There we go. You'll note that I'm taking all the screws I'm removing from the case and putting them into my magnetic parts tray. If you don't trust yourself to remember where everything came from, here's a nice little pro tip. Right panel. Boop, see? And they'll stay exactly where I put them. I tend to try to do some basic organization before I even start putting anything into the case. So here I'm just taking off the wire management clip that was pre-installed on my front panel connections. I can also scout the layout of my board and make sure that anything that I can is already pre-run to where it needs to go. So USB 3 is either down here on the bottom edge or over here on the right. When I can get away with it, I actually do prefer to use this one. I find it not as ugly looking. Oh right, for those who aren't familiar, this is what the USB 3 connection looks like. You can see it's actually keyed on one side and then there's one blank pin. That corresponds to the key on the slot and of course the blank pin on the slot right there. Now there are just two more things that we can pre-run before we install the motherboard. Any integrated RGB. So in this case, we've got uh, a lighting controller that actually does not just RGB, but also speed control for our included fans, as well as a hub for it, including a SATA power connector that's already close enough to our power supply that that's a perfectly good spot for it. And of course, our fans. Now, I did say before that we were gonna reposition those, so why don't we go ahead and do that? Now, strictly speaking, there was nothing wrong with our all exhaust configuration at the top and the back with a filtered intake, but we're gonna be using a pretty power hungry graphics card here, so being able to put some fresh air across it is definitely going to be an advantage, especially when you consider that modern graphics cards do get better performance when they have better cooling. So I'm gonna take one of my two fans, run the cables through the bottom here, 
and I'm gonna install it as an intake fan here along the bottom. That'll cool my hard drive, as well as throw some fresh air over to the power supply area. As for my second one, I'm gonna go ahead and put that one right here, and I'm gonna run my cables through this hole right about here. Now we need to pop off the front panel. On a lot of cases, this involves just grabbing the bottom of it and giving it a sharp yank, but on this one, you've actually gotta unscrew these. Now we take off the magnetic filter, get our screws back. We've got these slots rather than just holes, so if we wanted to make slight adjustments to their location, we'd be able to do that. You might notice that your fan screws are a little harder to put in than other ones. That's normal. These are self-tapping screws, and what they're actually doing is they're kind of shredding the plastic as they go through it. Let's throw our filter back on. What I'm doing right now with the fans is I'm kind of untangling the wires. I'm making it so that my RGB wires and my power wires aren't crossing each other because the RGB ones are both going to go to the same place down over here in the bottom right and power is actually going to come up across here and over here. This is really important before you install your motherboard you're going to want to scout out where the fan power connectors are on the board. Now, I like to see them along the bottom edge here or the right bottom edge here. That makes it particularly easy to install bottom or front fans. Unfortunately, this board being more of a value option has the fan connections right here. And then, uh, yeah, there was one more. It's labeled AIO pump, but that's fine. We can still put a fan there. So our rear fan, we're actually gonna plug into this one. And then our two front fans, we're gonna plug into these two. Unfortunately, that means our cable management is a little bit trickier because we don't want to just drag them all the way across the board. So we're going to go under the motherboard and then up over here for a nice short little run. That's why I'm running these guys right over here. Ah, well, I'm trying anyway. Get, get in there. Now it's time to install the motherboard. To do that, we're going to need the IO shield first. I always recommend checking these before you put them in the case and making sure that the tabs on the back here are bent up enough to allow the port through. Otherwise, they can actually stick into the port, short them out, and even fry them. So we're gonna do a quick sanity check, make sure we've got it oriented correctly. Yeah, that all looks fine. Now, we install it into the back of the case by lining it up, then pressing on each corner in turn. Once it's in, it shouldn't move around anymore at all. The last thing we need to check is whether the correct standoffs are installed in our case. This one is pretty good. It's actually got the nine standard ATX ones pre-installed, including one of these handy little nubbin ones that'll hold the board in place for you while you're screwing in the rest of them. But that's not always the case. Sometimes you'll have just these six, other times it'll have MATX standoffs pre-installed, and that's the most dangerous one, because if you've got an extra standoff scratching along the back of your board, it can actually cut these traces, destroying your motherboard, and you will not get warranty coverage for that. To double check this, we just pick up the board. Handle it by the edges, plastic connectors, back plates, whatever else you can get a firm grip on. I really like holding onto the CPU cooler because assuming you've got one with a decent mounting mechanism, that's a really, really secure handhold for it. As you lower in the board, I like to have it at about a 10 to 15 degree angle as I'm sliding it towards the back of the case. That helps me avoid those tabs that I mentioned before and also prevents us from scraping the back of the board along any standoffs that might or might not be in the right spots. Now we're gonna use that little nubbin to hold it in place and look through every hole and make sure that we can see exactly the number of standoffs that we're expecting to see. You can actually see here that our board doesn't need these three. It's a little bit slimmer than standard ATX. For bonus points, we could remove these from the case, but because they're not actually touching the back of the board, there's no safety reason to do it, so I'm just gonna leave them. Now that we know that's all good, I'm actually just gonna pop it out again and then I'm going to pre-wire up my top fans here. That way I can ensure that my runs are nice and tight and clean. There we go, not bad, right? Let's go ahead and screw the board in. Motherboard screws and any additional standoffs you might need are always included in the hardware that comes with your case. We're gonna be using these 632 thread button heads right here. And if you're ever not sure if you've got the right thing, you can always just hand thread one in and as long as it goes easily, you'll know that you're not gonna cross thread it. Don't wrench too tight on these guys. Once you start to meet resistance, give it maybe another 16th of a turn, maybe an eighth of a turn. That's it. 
And look at that, it's in. Now I know what you guys are thinking. Great, now the motherboard's in, we can put the graphics card. No, no. Now actually on this motherboard, uh, the graphics card would interfere with surprisingly few other things that we need to plug in, but still, it does make our lives easier if we go ahead and plug all the things that we can into our motherboard first. So let's do our USB 3 connector now. These have very fragile pins, so you wanna get it positioned just right. Ugh. Before applying pressure, you should hear a small click. And we can go ahead and run the rest of that cable around behind. Woo, nice. Don't try and bend this too tight, guys. If you bend this off your board, then it's dead. You can go ahead and run that uh, rear fan power connector here. You can see I'm putting a three pin fan connector on a four pin header. That's fine, just kind of aim to the right. Front panel audio looks just like a USB connector, except that instead of having a blanked out pin at the very end, it's uh, second to the end. So we're gonna go ahead and you know find somewhere to route that. Along here seems pretty good. And then we wanna bring that through, there we go, right at the very bottom right from the back. And then that's uh, bottom left from the front because on most motherboards these days, that's where the header is for it. So we just find the blanked out pin there, line it up and bippity boppity, there it is. We actually don't have front USB 2 on this case, but if we did, it would plug in in the same fashion right there. One of the pickiest parts of building a modern computer is of course the front panel lights and switches. Now, in a perfect world, I'd love to bring these up right underneath where the front panel header is, but unfortunately I'm stuck with either bringing it up through here or bringing it through over here. So I guess I'm gonna go this route. If you're stuck with exposed wires, one of my favorite old tricks is to put them in a little braid. So I'm just gonna treat two of them as one. With that out of the way, we can have a look at where everything goes. Lots of modern motherboards actually have them labeled, but there are a few general rules you can follow. The positive pin tends to be towards the left, so here we can do our hard drive LED, which you can see is the bottom left one first. Positive pin, swoop, to the left. Next up is our power LED. On many cases, these will be separated into individual pins because some motherboards have them right next to each other, others have a gap. This board actually has both options. You can either put them right next to each other here or have a gap there. I tend to just put them right above my hard drive LED. Now our reset switch, goes on the bottom right next to our hard drive LED. This one doesn't have a positive wire indicated, but that's because it doesn't matter. It's just gonna short those two wires. Same with the power switch, which goes right above that. Now it's time to, no, I'm just kidding. Put in the hard drive. Now there's about as many hard drive mounting mechanisms as there are stars in the sky. So <laughs> there's gonna be some variation here, but I can give you guys a few general rules. Corsair is using a sled based design here. You can actually see there's holes right here if you had a two and a half inch drive like a SATA SSD. And then they use a toolless mechanism to screw into, well not screw into, just poke into the holes on the side of the hard drive. So you're either gonna have some kind of sled based system that screws into the bottom or the sides or it tool-lessly does the aforementioned. Now we go ahead and slide this in until it clicks. Next, we grab a SATA data cable so this will be in your motherboard box. You can see there's a locking mechanism on one side and it's in like a little kind of L shape. That little point goes down on the drive. And then you can just check the keying and make sure it's correct on there. Put it until it clicks. We can go ahead and run this up here. And then over to the corresponding connector on our motherboard. Another thing that varies wildly from one case maker to another is the installation method of these bottom shrouds. You can see here that I'm not gonna be able to install my power supply without removing it first. So on this particular Corsair case, we're gonna need to take out this here thumb screw that holds it in place. Actually, that one might need to go too. Give me a second here. Oh, no, nope, that's the one. And this one can eh, slot out. There we go. That gives us a good look at the filtered intake for our power supply, as well as the uh, mounting holes here at the back. Since we're done handling most of the ESD sensitive components of our build, we can go ahead and just you know, put that somewhere, it doesn't really matter, and install our power supply now. I'm gonna go fan side down because this case has lots of space on the underside to draw in fresh air. 
And, you know, I'm gonna be a smart, responsible computer owner and not put it down on a carpet. For some reason, there are screws in the back of this power supply. That is not normal. You will find the mounting screws in the power supply box. Now, as we're putting it in, we can just place it down, push towards the motherboard, and then slide into the back of the case. You might notice at the back that there are gonna be some extra mounting holes here that you're not using. That's normal. That's in case you wanna mount your power supply in the other orientation. Personally, I can't think of too many reasons to do it that way in a case like this, unless maybe you wanted to use your power supply fan as an exhaust fan, if you had a heat generating component down like right here or something, but uh, generally speaking, this is the way you wanna go. Your power supply cables are usually found inside a little baggie in the power supply box. Here are the modular cables we're gonna need for our build, starting with the 24 pin, so called for its 24 pins, at least on this side. So the split connector, that's for the power supply end, and this is gonna go into our motherboard. See this little clip right here? That corresponds to that little clip on the side there. This does require a little bit of force, so if you can, I would recommend putting a little bit of backwards pressure on the back of the motherboard. We're gonna go ahead and run this through our cable management grommet. Next up, we've got our eight pin EPS connector. You can tell the difference between this one and an eight pin PCI Express connector in a couple of ways. One is that if it splits apart, it'll split into four and four instead of six and two. And the second way is that many PCI Express connectors actually have the gap between two of the pins bridged. Uh, I think it's uh, these ones here. You can tell there's still a little gap because it's a six plus two, but hey, whatever, there you go. Also, sometimes they helpfully label it CPU. So this one goes right about here. Again, clips to hooks until it clips into place. I find the best way to cable manage this one is over above the motherboard where it'll then go down the back until it reaches the power supply. For PCI Express, the type of cables you wanna use is gonna depend on your graphics card. We're using an RTX 2080 that has an eight pin and a six pin power connector. So unfortunately on our modular power supply, all of them are six plus twos. So we're gonna end up with an extra couple of pins that we're gonna to have to tuck away somewhere. But the good news is that we can use a single cable to run up to it. So our graphics card is gonna go in our top PCI Express slot. That's the one that is electrically 16X, which means we're gonna go ahead and run this bad boy, well, let's say right around there. That'll give us a nice straight shot over to it. Now you can run it up through the basement. We can have a look at that later, but I personally prefer this cable management to that way. Finally, we're gonna need SATA power for both our hard drive as well as our integrated RGB controller. This one plugs into the drive with the little teardrop down just like the data connector did. Once again though guys, please do be careful. This is a fragile connector, push it straight in. There we go. And then the second one is actually gonna plug into right here, our RGB hub, just like that. With all of our cables installed, we can turn our attention to routing them optimally. So what I've done here is I've found the RGB connector for my top fan. So that's gonna go into uh, RGB controller slot number two. Just like that. Then my bottom fan, I'm gonna use slot one. That way if I wanna apply any effects in IQ or whatever the case may be, I'll be able to go from one to two to three. That's my three RGB fans that I've got installed. I'm gonna take my power connector for this. I'm just gonna tuck it back here, making sure that I've still got enough space. Arr. There we go, that my side panel is going to fit on. And make sure I don't put any pressure on that SATA data connector. It's always important to watch out where you route your 24 pin connector. This is the biggest Python of a cable in a typical computer. So if you just run it here, you can see you're not going to be able to close the side panel. So what we want to do is run it kind of down and across spots where we have a wide enough gap. We can store any excess down in the basement since conveniently our case has a nice covered basement. We can run our graphics cable down there as well. Let's try not to cross our cables here. That way they'll lay down flatter. And then now, oh, put that back there. we can go ahead and tie some of these down. 
It's fairly typical to find disposable cable ties like these in the packaging for your power supply or your case, or both. But if you want to bind together a bigger bundle, I would recommend getting some of these Velcro ties. We actually have our own available, lttstore.com. I always love it when cases include these nice little loops for wire management. It costs basically nothing to implement and is a huge extra convenience when you're trying to build on them. The key to a decent, but not too time consuming cable management job is just making sure that none of your wires are crossing over each other. All right, well that looks serviceable to me. So now we're gonna go ahead and finish up with the connections on the other end of our power supply. I find it easiest in these cases to work from the back towards the front. So that's our six plus two pin for the graphics card. Here's our eight pin for the CPU. One nice thing about a modular power supply, guys, is that you can pre-install these on the power supply if you find it difficult to get at them after the fact. We can go ahead and do our 24 pin now. Move that SATA connector out of the way. Schwump. Finally, we've got our little six pin for SATA. That goes here, or really any of these spots. On this end of things, pretty much if it fits, then it sits. We'll start by taking out the two PCI slot covers that are just below the 16X slot that we're going to use to install our graphics card. So you can see what I mean by below here, right? So not this one, these two. Most modern graphics cards have a double wide backplate. This accommodates additional IO and also just the thicker coolers that they generally need. Now, it's not strictly speaking necessary, but we can prepare the slot by moving that tab back. And then we're gonna hold our card on both ends because we're gonna wanna apply even pressure as we're pushing it down into the case. I find it easiest to line up the I.O. first, and you can always double check that by looking down this side. You know, you wanna make sure a couple little things like these tabs aren't sticking through here because then they won't go in, little things like that. And if all that looks reasonably well aligned, then you flip back around to this side, look through these gaps. If you can see the holes, it's probably in the right spot. And then finally, check to make sure that that back tab on the card there is seated correctly. All looks good to me. And that's it. If this locks back into place, which it seems that it has, then your card is installed. Let's go ahead and put the screws in. Something to watch out for here, guys, is some cases um, don't accommodate screwdrivers very well. You can see mine doesn't fit here. Do yourself a favor, start it with your thumbs, and then finish it off with the screwdriver. That way you can make sure that you don't accidentally cross thread it. Now we'll go ahead and throw in our PCI Express connectors. You can see these six plus twos can be a little bit tricky. They've got a little kind of uh, block there. That makes it so that if you put that uh, under right there, you can push the whole thing in and the two pins won't accidentally slip out. So we'll go ahead and, and these are not super flexible. Some power supplies improve their efficiency in sort of a, I don't know, you could call it a bit of a hacky way by putting capacitors in the cables. You can see this is one that does that. Um, that tends to make the cables a little bit less flexible. Get a nice little orange accent on there. LTTstore.com. Oh, one more thing, guys. Uh, GPU sag is an issue where the kind of back end of the graphics card can tend to sag down because it's only really anchored at this side and then through the slot. And that's one of the reasons that I like putting my PCI Express cables over here up through the top because the stiffness of these cables and if you cable manage them nice and tight they can give it a little bit of support and keep it from kind of you know looking like it's falling out let's go ahead and throw our basement shroud back in place this one's just held in place by clips so we're just going to line those up and slide towards the back looking good and then the second one is a combination of clips and then that screw And now we are shockingly close to being ready for testing. We can go ahead and put our filter back on the top of the case. 
we can grab our front panel and reinstall that. And we are pretty much ready to test it out. So we'll go ahead and plug in a network cable, keyboard and mouse, display port to our monitor. There we go, any one of these is fine. Then finally your power supply power cable goes in. Don't forget to flip this to the on position guys. Otherwise you might go to press the button for the moment of truth and uh, nothing will happen. It's not a bad looking little system, eh? To do it over again, I'd probably move that rear fan to the front. It's a little unbalanced looking, but from a cooling perspective, this configuration is perfectly fine. So I'm just mashing delete here to get into the UEFI BIOS. And look at that. Everything looks normal, 9700K, all 16 gigs of RAM are showing. It's not running at full speed though, so we're gonna press F7 to go into advanced mode. Go to AI Tweaker and what the hey. Let's see if our XMP profile manages to do a thing here. Oh, that's interesting. I don't think that's the kit of memory I had intended to use. I thought it was a 3200 uh, CL14 kit. Do I have two mismatched sticks in here? Oops, these are not matching sticks. One moment, please. Oh no. All right. That's better. Throw our Windows install USB in here. So then now that everything looks correct in here, we're just gonna go over to boot, use boot override to boot to our USB stick that we've preloaded with Windows 10 and press enter. Then we basically just follow the prompts. Now that Windows is all installed, we're gonna get Asus's Q installer thing that shows up. Uh, we don't want any of these utilities probably. And we're gonna go ahead and install the drivers. While we wait for that, we can head over to nvidia.com, go to the GeForce driver section, select RTX 20 series. This doesn't really matter, but whatever, there you go. And then we're gonna select the DCH drivers. Now that all of our ASUS drivers are done and we've rebooted, we can go ahead and install the NVIDIA drivers that we downloaded earlier. While you're installing drivers is actually a great time to pop into the task manager and see if your CPU is turboing correctly because it tends to be a one or two threaded application. So we were turboing up to around 4.6, 4.7, 4.8 gigahertz. That's about what we'd expect. Now that we've got all our drivers installed though, we can make sure that the system is performing as we would expect. So I'm gonna go ahead and fire up Cinebench R20. This isn't the be all and end all of benchmarks, but what it will do is tell us what our CPU is turboing to and if our performance is within the range that we'd expect for the CPU model we have. All eight threads are clearly running, CPU usage is at 100%, and we are turboing to a nice healthy 4.57 gigahertz. Our fans did kick up a little bit, but everything's well within reason. If they were louder than we'd like, what we could do is install ASUS's fan control software and set a custom curve on it though. You can see we exceeded our short-term boost limit. So we're sitting at around 4.25 gigahertz. Still pretty healthy. I also wanna know if my graphics card is behaving normally. So let's just do some fur mark. Okay. So obviously that wasn't a full computer burn-in suite or anything, but what we know now is at least no artifacts or anything. Yeah, it's probably good enough that we can at least close up the side panels. Now all that's left is years and years of gaming. And check this out, guys. We are getting in excess of 250 frames per second in CSGO with everything basically cranked. Man, that is some good realism right there. It's so realistic. I could all, look. Oh, ow. That was weird. Wait, was that whole thing just a dream? Couldn't have been. Because here's the computer we built. 
Thanks for watching guys. Hope you enjoyed our POV PC build guide. Massive shout out to Intel for sponsoring this video and of course our other hardware partners for providing all their parts. So you got Corsair, G-Skill, Asus, and I guess we had a Seagate hard drive in there as well. Guys, make sure you are subscribed. And if you haven't already, maybe check out one of our previous build guides where maybe you don't get the POV experience, but you definitely get a bit of a more macro look at some of the finer details. We're gonna have one of those linked below for you. Thanks to Intel once again for sponsoring this video. Intel actually has an excellent step-by-step -step guide with pre-build checklists and tips on how to build your first gaming PC. And we're gonna have that linked in the video description.